Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last week, SpaceX made news by launching their first batch of Starlink version 2 satellites. But for me, perhaps the most interesting piece of technology on there were the new Hall Effect thrusters which were going to run on Argon, making them vastly more cost effective than competing ion thrusters. Hall Effect thrusters are one type of electrostatic propulsion system. The other common type that's in use is the gridded ion thrusters, but Hall Effect thrusters have come to dominate the higher thrust, lower specific impulse end of the market. Uh, there are other types of thrusters with other ideas, but with Hall Effect thrusters on every single Starlink satellite, they're now the most common in use by a long way. So electrostatic thrusters work on the principle of ionizing propellant atoms by knocking an electron off them, and then you accelerate the ions through an electrostatic field to very high speeds. And importantly, after those uh, ions are ejected, they also need to be neutralized, so you have an electron gun that's spraying electrons after them to you know, neutralize the whole thing. So exhaust velocities on these thrusters are many times higher than the exhaust from a chemical thruster, which means for the same fuel mass, they can accelerate a spacecraft to higher speeds. The downside, of course, is that they need a lot of electrical power to do this, and they don't generate much thrust because they're constrained by the power requirements. Even the most powerful ion thrusters in use generate only grams of thrust, so it's like having a mouse push your spacecraft around. And that means the spacecraft can take months of accelerating before they can really start to take advantage of the extra performance of these thrusters. Now, while they're commonly called electric thrusters, it is important to be clear that they are not pure electric. They need a propellant that they can push against. They need it for reaction mass. This isn't like the EM drive, Mach effect drives, or whatever the quantized inertia people are thinking about. I mean, look, a pure electric engine would revolutionize science if one of these propellantless thrusters actually worked. Uh, and I'd love to see that happen, but for now we're working in the real world and engines generally need propellant to push against. Now historically, the most popular propellant has been xenon, uh, since it's the noble gas which requires the least amount of ionization energy per unit mass. SpaceX has already used uh, Krypton in their first generation Starlink, and now they have Argon in the new Starlink. Other options that have been used include mercury, cesium, iodine, bismuth. They actually have lower ionization energies, which helps with the power use, uh, but they're also more chemically active, and that means your changes to accommodate this reactivity in your thruster hardware. The concept of electric thrusters actually dates back over a century to Konstantin Tsiolkovsky's work in the early 1900s. It was all theoretical at that point, but by the 1960s, Harold Kaufman had developed a working gridded ion thruster using mercury as a, prope as a propellant. And this would actually fly in space and demonstrate itself on sounding rockets as the solar electric rocket test, you know, basically demonstrating the thruster. The Soviet Union around the same time focused on developing the Hall effect thruster, and they would actually begin flying those on operational satellites in the 1970s. So the Soviet designs would be operational for two decades before the US started considering the electric thrusters to be not an experimental thing. So in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet research on Hall effect thrusters made its way to the US, and now we have both Hall effect thrusters and gridded ion thrusters in use on space missions. The two designs have different performance characteristics, so they actually complement each other quite well. The gridded ion thrusters, they get better specific impulse, while the Hall effect thrusters get higher thrusts. So the choice of propulsion technology really depends upon the mission requirements. I often talk about the tyranny of the rocket equation, and you might think that the best engine will always be the one with the highest specific impulse. But the thing is, on an electric thruster, uh, the specific impulse is basically the exhaust velocity. And that exhaust velocity means kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy goes as the velocity squared. So if you double the specific impulse, you quadruple the electrical energy requirements. And that means, in turn, that the power systems, the solar panels, the batteries, the electronics, the power regulators, all that stuff are four times the size 
So you need more mass now to be accelerated if you want to have this more higher specific impulse engine. You could build hypothetical spacecraft designs and you know just run them through mission scenarios and you can figure out that for a given uh, duration of flight there is a specific impulse which maximizes your performance and for things like uh, short-term missions in low Earth orbit, about 1,500 seconds of performance is perfect. If you are, say, the Dawn spacecraft that is in deep space traveling between asteroids, then higher specific impulses work better for you because you're accelerating for more time and have more time to exploit this. Okay, so let's now talk about how these two different uh, thrusters work in practice. Gridded ion thrusters, they use a series of electrically charged grids to set up an electric field to drive the ions. Basically, you have holes in the grid, and as the ions go in, you've got a positive charge plate, a negative charge grid, and as they go between them, that means there's an electric field, and so the ions get accelerated through. But before that, they need to go into an I that you need to start with a neutral atoms in an ionization chamber. You basically inject the gas in and it gets ionized. How does it get ionized? Well, you t what you do is you smash electrons into the atoms and that knocks electrons off. So you can either have like an electron gun spraying electrons around and knocking them off, or you can use like an electrode de electrodeless design which uses like oscillating magnetic or electromagnetic fields and that will drive any free electrons in the neutral gas. Drive it hard enough, you can set up a self-discharging uh, you know, arc and that will ionize your plasma. Now the ionization chamber will also have uh, like magnets around it to sort of help separate the ions and the electrons and also to sort of stop things hitting the walls. So these ions will then drift towards the first of your grids. And the first of your grids is like a screening grid. It's positively charged. On the, the exterior one is negatively charged. So the positively charged ions flow through this. And as soon as they go through, they're like, oh, there's a big electric field here. They accelerate through and shoot off into space. And then, of course, you then have another electron gun spraying electrons after them so that the exhaust gets neutralized. So this exhaust velocity is typically of the order of like 15 to 40 kilometers per second, depending on the design. Now, a number of designs also include a third grid. This is actually a deceleration grid. It's positively charged. And the idea is that this reduces the number of uh, ions impacting the other grids and therefore reduces erosion because you can have the ions potentially flowing back and hitting the positively charged plate. And this helps screen them from that. And then there's a four grid design, which has a pair of uh, grids that are designed to pull the ions out of the ionization chamber. And it has a much larger gap for the acceleration stage. And that means that they can accelerate it much faster. And this kind of four layer grid has achieved some of the highest specific impulses of any uh, propulsion system. Something like over 100 kilometers per second is pretty you know, it's pretty possible and yes as i said because of the power requirements this is all very interesting but there aren't really any missions that really fit with this so anyway that's the high performance one onto the hall effect thrusters and so on the surface hall effect thrusters they don't actually have these grids on the outside instead they emit the exhaust from like a circular channel like a groove an annulus which is uh where your your action happens the important thing to realize is that in the Hall thrusters, they create a negatively charged cloud of electrons just inside this channel. And at the bottom of the channel is the positively charged anode where the propellant is introduced, ionized, and then because the, the, you've got the anode, the positive anode, and the electron cloud, the ions get accelerated through this and again shoot off into space. Now, how does this electron cloud get held in place? Well, there's magnets involved. I mean, of course, if you're a physicist, you knew that magnets were involved somewhere because the Hall effect very specifically describes what happens when you have an electric current meeting magnetic field lines. It causes the electric current to go sideways and generates like a potential difference. Anyway, in the center of the ring, there is a magnet and the poles of this magnet are basically pointed along the direction of thrust. And then surrounding it, there's a bunch of other magnets, typically four, and their poles will be aligned in the opposite direction. That means the magnetic field lines cross neatly over the, uh, the annulus. 
And outside of the thruster, you have an electron gun, and that is spraying electrons out away from it. But they then see the positively charged anode inside the ring, and they're like, I want to go there. But as they fall down, they hit the magnetic field. And the magnetic field says, "Uh uh-uh, you're going to go sideways. So they start swirling around and basically become this cloud of trapped electrons that are being, that are slowly falling towards the anode, but are mostly being held in place. Now, it's important to realize that while the cloud itself is slow moving, the electrons are actually moving really fast, but they're just spinning around in circles all the time. So at the anode, you introduce the neutral gas, and as it diffuses along the channel, it starts to encounter these electrons that are spinning around. And those electrons are moving fast enough that when they collide with the ions, they knock electrons off and the ions now see that there's this positively charged anode, this negatively charged cloud of electrons, and they get pulled along and shoot out of the thruster. And as they escape the thruster, that electron gun that started all this, it is neutra- it will neutralize those ions and you'll get a uh, your thrust out of this out of this thing. So typically these Hall effect thrusters, they can't uh, generate as high an electric field, so the exhaust velocity is lower, typically 10 to 20 kilometers per second. One question the smart people might have is why the magnets can hold on to a, an electron cloud while then similarly allowing electrically charged ions to pass through. Why doesn't that affect the ions? Well, there's a big difference in the mass between these two species, like factor of thousands. And when you calculate the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field, there's an important value called the Larmor radius. That is, for a given velocity, mass, and charge, the particles will orbit in circles with a characteristic radius. Now, a Hall effect thruster will be designed so that this radius for the electrons is much smaller than the size of the channel, allowing the electrons to basically move around inside the channel without hitting the walls. But for the heavier ions, they have a radius which is many, many times the size of the thruster, so that they do curve, but they don't curve significantly as they cross through it and they're effectively going in a straight line. Now, as I said, Hall effect thrusters, they don't get the higher exhaust velocities of the gridded ion thrusters, but they do have better better mass flow rates. Indeed, there's actually something of an ongoing scientific question or mystery because they get higher flows than are predicted by all the models and the science. And you know, this is very nice to have, the thruster works better than you'd expect, but because you can't do it analytically, you pretty much need to build a test device and see how it works to actually quantify it. So now, uh, one of the other important things to know about both types of electric thruster is that they both suffer from erosion because of all those high energy ions and electrons flying around. These can strike surfaces, they can like embed themselves in the material, they can break down, they can modify crystal structures and just or just knock atoms off. Eventually, you erode things and the thruster will start to degrade in, the, in its performance until something goes wrong and the whole thing stops functioning. You'll often see that the data sheets for these designs will have uh, life limits, guaranteed limits on how long they expect it to work and how long, how much thrust it will generate over its lifetime. And another important parameter for designers is the efficiency. This is basically calculating the electrical energy that goes in versus the kinetic energy of the exhaust out. Now, energy in these systems is typically lost as heat in the electrical systems. There's also energy lost by the ions that strike the walls or the grids. That also converts to heat. But also importantly, energy is required to ionize the propellants. And this is basically like a participation tax. You have to ionize the stuff. You can't get away without it. And this ionization tax is especially important if you change the propellant. As I said, xenon is the most popular because the ionization energy per unit mass is lower than the other noble gases. But on top of this, it's the heaviest noble gas at least amongst the ones that have stable non-radioactive isotopes. So that means you get fewer atoms per kilogram on top of less energy per atom. So switching to krypton or even argon has a double penalty. Changing the propellant in a Hall effect thruster may also need changes to the electric or magnetic field strength or the thruster geometry, as changing the atomic mass of the the, propellant means changing that uh, Larmor radius. 
So I hope you appreciate that SpaceX's recent launch of Starlink satellites using argon Hall effect thrusters wasn't something they could have achieved just by buying off-the-shelf hardware and then switching up the propellant. You know, you had to develop a complete system and tune it and test it. But it is, it is you know, something they did and it's a big step in cost savings for uh, you know, Starlink satellites. Argon is something like 1% of the cost of xenon. It's made as a side product from liquefying air so you can get liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. And you know, I've talked about the two main types of thrusters. There are other electric thruster designs out there. Uh, one is the field emission electric propulsion. It uses a liquid metal propellant and uh, like a blade or a needle. Uh, that's apparently in use on the European Space Agency's uh, LISA Pathfinder mission. There's other types that are like ion, electrostatic, electromagnetic, plasma dynamic thrusters, lots of papers, lots of test hardware. But as far as I know, None of this stuff has really been flown in space and truthfully it's because existing technologies are doing just fine for the mission requirements in hand and as you know space flight is rather risk averse. After all electric thrusters are an idea that is a century old and only now do we see the majority of satellites actually flying with them. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.